I put together um, a video or two of um, material from Worf's publications and my comments on it, because I'd like to be able to refer to these things when I talk about Worf and the Worfian hypothesis. But I, I, you know, it would take too much time during my discussion of the Worfian hypothesis per se. So I'm preparing this material ahead of time. And if you could um, look at this, that'd be great. So each of these videos is um, 30 minutes or less. And um, so I hope you can take a look at them. I'm going to begin by looking at some of what's written in the preface and the introduction to uh, language thought and reality. Um, I've made a couple of videos here. I've edited, edited them some in what follows. So don't be too surprised if there are a couple of jumps from one section to another. It's not a beautiful editing job that I've done. I've done the best I can. So um, let's go ahead and, and look at the preface and the introduction. It's really out there. Anyway, uh, I think a lot of people understand Worf through the preface and the introduction. And that's the only reason why it's worth talking about it at all. So, you know, we take this material in the preface and the introduction with a, a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, well, let's take a look at um, page V in the preface. It begins with this. Once in a blue moon, a man comes along who grasps the relationship between events, which have hitherto seemed quite separate and gives mankind a new dimension of knowledge. Einstein demonstrating the relativity of space and time with such a man. In another field, and on a less cosmic level, Benjamin Lee Wark was one, to rank someday perhaps with such great social scientists as Franz Boas and William James. Um, I'll, I'll continue a little bit. He grasped, that is to say, Wark grasped the relationship between language, human language, and human thinking, how language can indeed shape our innermost thought. And he quotes Worf here, who wrote, We are thus introduced to a new principle of relativity, which holds that all observers are not led by the same physical evidence and the same picture of the universe, unless their linguistic backgrounds are similar and can in some way be calibrated. Um, and in the next paragraph, Stuart Chase writes, Speakers of Chinese dissect nature and the universe differently from Western speakers. He goes on in the next paragraph, he says, uh, Worf was a profound scholar in the comparatively new science of linguistics. Um, you know, if you read Battle in the Minefields, which is a book that I'm going to make a lot of reference to, it. it's a book I published last year with Bernard Lax. Uh, last year is 2019. And uh, we spent a lot of time actually in the first chapter talking about this idea that linguistics was a new science. Um, it wasn't comparatively new, or perhaps it was newer than uh, than physics, but it was a science that went back 150 years already at the time that Chase was writing. Um, and, and then on the next page, um, Chase summarizes uh, what, what he takes Worf's points to be in the following way. First, that all higher levels of thinking are dependent on language, and second, that the structure of the language one habitually uses influences the manner in which one understands his environment. The picture of the universe shifts from tongue to tongue, that is, from language to language. Um, I, yeah, all right, maybe that's a way to interpret what he says. Um, let's go on and look at the introduction written by John Carroll, the psycholinguist. Um, on, on page three, there's an interesting point, interesting only because we, we're talking in the, and living in the, in the time of COVID-19. On, um, on page three, um, Carol is talking about um, Worf's early life. And so Worf went, um, graduated from high school in 1914, and then he went to MIT and he studied chemical engineering. Um, and he writes... Again, Carol writes, in the fall term of the senior year, a mysterious illness acquired in an ROTC summer camp forced Worf to be absent from classes. The necessity of making up deficiencies the following summer um, delayed his obtaining the degree of Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering until October 1918. Well, you know, I, I read this 
many times in the past. Now I know perfectly well what it was that uh, Worf had. It wasn't mysterious at all. It was the flu. This is obviously the um, 1918 pandemic of the, the flu, the so-called Spanish flu. Um, you know, and that Spanish flu is not very well represented in the history books that we read, but uh, today we know perfectly well what that was. Anyway, going on to page six, um, by his own account, Worf did not become interested in linguistics until 1924. Well, let me just say a little bit about Worf's lifetime. Worf was born in 1897, and in the end he died in 1941 at the age of 44. He was a young man. Um, and it, it looks like he died of cancer. They say that he died of a, a long and lingering um, disease. He spent his career as a chemical engineer working for a fire insurance company. Apparently he had a very successful career in that regard. Um, he became interested in languages early on in linguistics in 1924. You know, we should say something about the history of linguistics in the United States. Um, Bloomfield and Sapir were in some regards the, the leading linguists of, in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, Bloomfield and some of his colleagues were um, central in creating the Linguistic Society of America, which had its very first meeting in um, December, Christmas time of 1924. And then the journal language started immediately after that. Um, okay, let's go on to page seven. Uh, here, um, John Carroll talks a bit about uh, the influences on Worf's life. There are a couple things that he leaves out that turn out to be important. On page seven, um, he writes that, um, that Worf had been deeply impressed by the fundamentalist shadowings of his Methodist Episcopal religious background. Um, and he talks about, he, Carol talks about a, a manuscript that, um, that Worf wrote, Why I Have Discarded Evolution. There's, um, okay, and then in 1924, writes Carol, he turned his mind to the study of Hebrew. And it says, it may come as a surprise to some that Worf's interest in linguistics stemmed from one in religion. Well, let me interrupt uh, Carol here and, as I continue to do, and say, actually, if you know something about the history of linguistics, there's really nothing surprising about it at all. In fact, the history of linguistics is the history, um, uh, the history, let's say, of early linguistics is the history of the importance of the study of language for religion. Um, the greatest uh, linguistic tradition in the past was, was that of Panini and the study of Sanskrit in India. And um, that was a study that was motivated by the need to continue to understand the Sanskrit in, in which the ancient um, religious texts in India, those texts were written in Sanskrit and it was crucial that as the spoken colloquial languages of India continue to, to, ch to change and to become no longer Sanskrit in time. It was necessary to maintain an understanding of that language and hence uh, linguistics arose, the, um, which included the, the Paninian tradition. And the same thing is true elsewhere. Um, in the eighth century, that is to say a hundred years after the death of Muhammad, um, a, a tradition, a linguistic tradition arose um, and the panini, so to speak, of the Islamic tradition is Sibawe, and Sibawe is the, the great uh, Islamic linguist. And for exactly the same reason, linguistics arose in the Islamic tradition in order to maintain an understanding of the, the Quran, the, the Arabic that was um, written down in the holy uh, text of, of Islam, and an, another great tradition which uh, has its echoes in the way we understand language today is the um, medieval uh, Jewish tradition in which the um, Hebrew of the, of the Bible, what Christians would call the Old Testament, the uh, Hebrew of the Bible um, was analyzed. 
and the language Hebrew was kept alive as it could be without um, large numbers of, of native speakers during the couple thousand years um, before the, the creation of the state of, of Israel. So all of which is to say, no surprise whatsoever if a person who's interested in religion should be interested in linguistics. It's the existence of ancient texts that are uh, crucial to the study of institutional religions and which of course are a natural connection to linguistics. Um, however, however, Worf was interested in a kind of a mystical study of the Bible that was motivated by his reading of work by Antoine Fabre d'Olivet, um, who was writing in the, the um, end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. And yes, Worf became very interested in, how should we say, sort of non-central, of kind of out there um, mystical understandings of the universe. And pretty much nowhere in this book, Language, Thought, and Reality, do we see any serious discussion of um, Worf's deep interest in theosophy. And, well, I'm not going to go into it here, but theosophy was a um, very influential, mystical approach, um, which was spearheaded by a Russian emigre whose name was uh, Madame Blavatsky. Um, anyway, let's get back to this int introduction. We can talk about Madame Blavatsky and theosophy uh, at some point. Um, in his early work in the 20s, before Worf really got in touch with Sapir and mainstream linguists, um, Worf was very interested in, in the idea, which was championed by Fawad Dorive, that certain languages can be best understood semantically in terms of their meaning, as, the, as in a sense the result of a small number like 50, um, roots, roots that had a form, meaning made of consonants and possibly vowels, and also a meaning. And if we look, for example, at the, at the history of Socio, who was one of the great founders of modern linguistics, Socio, he was a, um, a Swiss linguist who lived a couple decades before um, Worf, um, his early work, too, was um, spearheaded by the interesting idea that languages had a small number of sort of central morphemes of, that had meaning, and languages put these meanings together when they create words. Um, in any event, back to Worf. Um, so Worf created this term, oligosynthesis, I guess, out of out of radicals, out of pieces of words, roots of words that he had learned as a chemist. Um, and um, we see on page 12, oligosynthesis, that's that word that Worth created, is a name for that type of language structure in which all or nearly all of the vocabulary may be reduced to a very small number of roots or significant elements. I, in fact, he says no more than about 35 on the next page. Um, so uh, Worf got in touch with, found out about the Linguistic Society of America, and starting in 1929, the linguistics uh, at the LSA um, started hosting linguistics institutes during the summer, and they were originally eight weeks, if I'm not mistaken. And, I, and 1929, I think, was the first one. Um, and for a long time, these summer institutes were given every year. The, the reason was really very simple, and that was that you know there there wasn't an internet, obviously, and there weren't airplanes, and it was and there weren't that many linguists. And what linguists there were who had university jobs were not in linguistics departments. There there were no linguistics departments, um, basically. Um, and so, if people wanted to learn about linguistics, they had to go to the lingu to a linguistics um, institute where linguists would come together from all over the country and spend eight, work, eight weeks during the summer just living and breathing linguistics. University of Michigan was a, um, was a host to the Linguistics Institute 
for a long time. Today, that is, those institutes still exist um, because of the expense that they incurred. They, in, over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, they've been only every second year in odd numbered years. Um, but for a long time, they were every summer. Certainly when I was, when I was a young linguist, they, they happened every year. Um, so uh, Worf met Edward Sapir um, in 1928 originally, and because they both lived in um, Connecticut, uh, Sapir in 1931 moved to, to Yale, which is in New Haven, which is actually where I am at this very moment. Um, in 19, uh, Sapir moved to Yale in 1931, and um, uh, Worth was living in New Haven, which is not very far. It's about 45 miles uh, from um, from New Haven, where Yale is. Sorry, Worth was living about 45 minutes by car from New Haven, and I guess he's, he was in Hartford, I think. Um, and so, over the course of the 1930s, he became a part of the intellectual circle, the graduate students, and then the postdocs, who were who lived and breathed around Sapir um, in, at Yale. Um, lots to say about Sapir, which I've already said in, in um, Battle in the Minefields, if you want to know more about Sapir and what he was doing, incredibly interesting story. In any event, um, Sapir taught at the 1937 Linguistics Institute. He had a heart attack then, and um, that following year, Sapir, sorry, that following year, Worf had a, um, an appointment at Yale as a visitor. And I believe he took on Sapir's teaching role for that year. In any event, he was there and he interacted with, uh, Worf was at Yale and he interacted with um, really very important, influential and brilliant linguists, such as Morris Swadesh, Stanley Newman, George Traeger, Charles Vogelin, um, and Mary Haas. This I'm just reading here from page 16 of the introduction. Um, yeah, and it looks a little bit more at what he was doing, um, what Worf was doing. On page 17, there's a quote that the Hopi actually have a language better equipped to deal with vibratile phenomena than is our latest terminology. We'll come back to that, that quote when we look at Worf's paper. Um, uh, yeah, but I want to read you these things because they're in the introduction that uh, Carol wrote and because this has had a, a big impact on how people remember Worf. Um, and so Carol writes that, uh, that Worf said that the Hopi mind automatically separates the occupancy or spot of ground or floor on which the occupancy occurs from the use to which the occupancy is put where speakers of English tend to merge these two together, where we say school, and we're thinking both of, of an institution and a building. Um, and that's certainly true. All right. Um, oh, yes. When you get to page 20, there is some reference to um, Worf's engagement with theosophy, but it's really, really understated uh, compared to what it ought to be, if we were to be honest, to the importance of theosophy in Worf's life. Oh yeah, on page 24, there's just a, an allusion to Worf's view about psychology, which is also very important. Um, and um, again, I talk, yeah, on page 24 of the introduction, um, Carol makes some remarks about psychology, and I'll come back to that as we look at the very brief notes that uh, Worf has on psychology as, as, uh, as he sees it in the 1920s. Anyway, what Carroll wrote in the introduction on page 24 is, none of the psychological schools on the contemporary scene were of any real help, as Worf complained in a short unpublished note, which supplied with the wholly arbitrary title on psychology um, is also printed here. Um, yet much of Worf's work is extremely close to psychology. Well, yeah, Sapir, uh, Worf wouldn't have said so, but it's Carol, who is a psychologist, who's, who's saying that. Um, skipping ahead to page 26, the idea of linguistic relativity did not emerge in a full-fledged form 
until after Worf started studying with Sapir. Um, Worf's whole outlook on linguistics dealt with fundamental intellectual operations. Worf insists that linguistics is essentially the quest for meaning. And yeah, that was pretty consistent with um, what Sapir thought. And Sapir studied meaning um, along with his student Swadesh, for example, it was um, pretty wildly not keep in keeping with the understanding of linguistics that Leonard Bloomfield was championing at the time. Um, Carroll writes here on page 26 that Worf was more interested in what, in some abstract sense, was being thought about than with the mental processes by which one might think. And this outlook led him to linguistics full of content rather than to psychology relatively contentless in its concern with generalized stimulus response mechanisms. And I think that's right. Um, Worf's concern with, was with content, what was thought about concepts, concepts that are used by speakers in order to understand the world. Um, okay, they talk about relativity. Um, on page 28, there's some references to, well, oh, let me just read a little bit at the bottom of page 27, top of 28. In truth, the validity of the linguistic relativity principle has thus far not been sufficiently demonstrated, neither has it been flatly refuted. Okay, this is the, you know, 1955 we're talking. It seems to be agreed that languages differ in many strange and striking ways, but it's a moot point whether such differences in language structure are associated with actual differences in ways of perceiving or uh, perceiving and conceiving the world. Among the writers who are most impressed with the possibilities of association are Cluckhorn and Leighton, Hoyer, and, and again, uh, Cluckhorn. Um, he, here's something important for you to know. Um, as you, you already know, the Superior, well, I think I mentioned he died in 1939, and I mentioned that Worf died in 1941. Um, in the post-war world, World War II ended in 1945, and one of the uh, important, uh, something of importance that, that happened in the United States at the end of World War II was the um, engagement on the part of the federal government to remain in a close relationship with scientists. Um, the federal government had underwritten a tremendous amount of science during World War II, as you know, the creation of the nuclear bomb and also the cre creation of radar and um, the creation of computers. And the United States government decided to continue to be, to work closely with scientists. They created, the, the United States created the National Science Foundation. Um, and there was a big question as to the extent to which the federal government would remain in close contact with social sciences. Um, the social sciences had played a very important role in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, um, which is the forerunner to the CIA. The OSS had been an important organization during World War II and played a, a significant role in, in the war effort. In the 1950s, Social scientists were doing their best in order to convince the federal government that what social scientists did um, was important as well. And um, the sapir whorf linguistic relativity hypothesis was one of, the, um, one of the steps taken by social scientists to show that they too could come up with interesting and useful hypotheses and that they were scientists as well. Um, there was a conference that was organized at the University of Chicago, I'm trying to remember the year, it might have been 53, and there was a book that was published, which I believe came out in 1955, which was the result of this, and I believe that these papers here, in, published in 53 and 54, are related to that. Cluckhorn was an um, anthropologist um, who was... Uh, played an important role in the development of social sciences, especially at Harvard, at Harvard, the creation of the social relations department, which is another story I, I won't get into here. It's very interesting with regard to the, the evolution of 
uh, the social sciences in the United States in the post-war period. Um, Klockholm was a tremendous fan of Sapir, and it's really clear that if Sapir had not died in 1939, he would have played a tremendously important role um, in the development of the social sciences in the early 1950s. That would have been around the time that he was retiring, but he would have played an important role. Um, two sharp critics, on page 28, we read two sharp critics of worst methodology and conclusions were Lennonberg, who will play an, an important role um, later on, and Foyer. Okay. Um, let me just read a little bit here about these criticisms. Um, Lennonberg attacks chiefly the methodologists. First, he criticizes on several grounds the technique of translation, which Worf so often implies to demonstrate differences in languages, large differences in linguistic handling of an event like cleaning of a gun, do not necessarily imply corresponding differences in the perception of that event and may merely result from metaphorical developments in the language. You know, okay, let's interrupt. Um, mere, anytime you see mere or merely, put your hand in your pocket, check if your wallet's been stolen. Because a lot of times what people say is merely X. Well, that X is huge, and they don't want you to remember this. So metaphors can be absolutely huge in a language, um, as we've come to learn. Um, anyway, continuing with the, what I'm reading here, may result, re merely result from metaphorical developments in the language of which the speakers may not ordinarily be aware, just as we do not ordinarily think of breakfast as breaking a fast. Well. But that has nothing to do with, with metaphor that has to do with it's certainly true that speakers are not aware that breakfast means breaking a fast. But you know, linguists don't make that mistake. You know, we're linguists, we understand things like that. And what were the arguments that Warfare is making nothing to do with, um, you know, uh, uh, frozen and obscure um, compound words. Uh, so, you know, Lennberg should not be accusing linguists of making that mistake because you know, we're professionals. We don't make that mistake. Second, Lennonberg insists that the linguistic and non-linguistic events must be separately observed and described before they can be correlated. And this is a huge point from, from my point of view, and I, I don't agree with Lennonberg, um, but I think most people do. Um, and he, So Lennonberg insists also that the usual canons of evidence must be applied in demonstrating any association between such events Otherwise, the linguistic relativity principle may become embarrassingly circular or at least tautological. Well, yeah, maybe, or maybe it'll be weaker. Maybe the correct form will be weaker than somebody like perhaps Lennonberg wants it to be. Um, I, you know, I think is these demands may be setting the bar uh, in a certain sense too high, or at least maybe setting it in the wrong direction. Um, in that the only evidence for differences in worldview turn out to be linguistic differences. Well, yeah, that may be, but it may be that that's huge. Foyer, a social philosopher, believes that on a priori grounds one would not expect cultures speaking different languages to have different ways of perceiving space, time, causation, and other fundamental elements of the physical world because a correct perception of these elements is necessary to survival. Well, you can obviously see the, the ongoing effects of the Darwinian, um, Darwinian revolution and you know, a priori argumentation like that doesn't cut a lot in at least my understanding of the world. Um, on the next page, 29, Carol comes back to that, replies and says, there's a further consideration which has not been sufficiently stressed in the various discussions of the superior Whorf hypothesis, namely that the principle of linguistic relativity may not be so tautological as it's been made to appear. It's been said that one merely states a type, you know, merely, notice that merely there. We should read that without the merely in there. Let me read that sentence and not say the word merely. It's been said that one states a tautology when one appeals to differences in language as showing differences in behavior and worldview. Um, it's also been said that it's necessary to find non-linguistic behaviors which are correlated with linguistic differences. This would doubtless be desirable, but there's something to be said for being interested in linguistic differences as such, regardless of non-linguistic behavioral correlates, because there, there's a lot that can be learned and studied 
by looking at what people say about things and when they write philosophy books or histories or laws or whatever. Um, okay, let me get to the end of this introduction. Okay, so this really brings me to the end of this discussion of the introduction. And I'm going to turn now to some of the material that, um, that Worf himself wrote.